welcome everyone. I'm really excited to kind of talk to you guys a bit more today about sort of PMS and kind of what what I feel I wish women knew more about as well as about hormone imbalance. And so a little bit about me. I'm Lauren Coletti. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm board certified in functional medicine. And really my background um, is in family medicine, women's health, hormone replacement, and sort of anti-aging longevity. Um, my expertise, I work with women um, with hormone issues, fertility, postpartum, gut health, autoimmunity. I do a lot of nervous systems to support as well as some more complex chronic disease. But I really just, I understand really the complexities of what we, we would call disease or imbalances that are going on in our body and, and really able to work to understanding the root cause of these issues. Um, we do, I do this all while really continuing to validate um, the person in front of me and honoring their experience, as well as giving them tools and knowledge and really belief in themselves, empowering them to ultimately become their own healers. I'm also a mom. I have three children, a wife and, um, you know, athlete. I try to keep as active as I can. Um, but I used to be completely burnt out, really just disconnected from my body, um, ignoring the signals that my body was giving me. And as I've gotten healthier, I've really realized that not only is my goal to help women feel healthy and vital, but for also to help them feel grounded, powerful and resourced. So today, um, you know, PMS, hormone imbalance is, is quite a large topic. I've really tried to hone in on helping you understand what is PMS, um, really explaining the menstrual cycle and really just our innate cyclical nature as women and, and symptoms of hormone imbalance. And just really when menstrual symptoms really need to be further evaluated and then how to do that. We talk, I'll also mention about different treatment options, giving you, you know, practical support that you can utilize now after, um, if you're struggling with any of these symptoms, and then what sort of testing and what to do next. So let's just start with the basics. What is PMS? PMS, it stands for premenstrual syndrome, and it is a syndrome, which is basically, it's a characterization, it's a set of symptoms that can include, so it's not, a, the diagnosis does not depend on having all of these symptoms, it really is just a set of symptoms that many women struggle with, that's cramping, bloating, breast tenderness, headaches, trouble sleeping, sugar cravings, mood changes, and swings, and these these tend to happen, okay, when do they usually occur? It usually occurs in, the, it occurs in the second half of our cycle. Sometimes women will have some symptoms around ovulation, and then more typically it's about three to seven days prior to their period. So just to kind of rem remind, when you, if a woman has a diagnosis of PCOS, um, dysmenorrhea, which we call, which we diagnose as irregular, very heavy periods, endometriosis, fibroids, really heavy periods. You all, all these diagnoses, many women will experience PMS. However, PMS is not the root cause of those. So just, we won't be getting into depth on some of these diagnoses, but I just wanna differentiate that. So PMS symptoms really are caused by three things, really estrogen dominance, low progesterone, or nutrient depletion. Specific nutrients that we, we look at and focus on are deficiencies in B vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin A, omega-3 fatty acids, and then certainly iron deficiency. And so for many women, PMS can be very severe. And oftentimes we'll be feeling these symptoms really for 10 to 14 days out of the month, which is about 50% of the time if we're talking about a 28-day uh, menstrual cycle. So that's 50% of the time to really be feeling not like yourself. And while we can certainly attribute this to hormones, um, really severe PMS and struggling in this way is not a normal part of being a woman, okay? I feel like a big problem is when we really normalize these symptoms and ignore them by taking medication, birth control, and not trying to understand the root cause. Now that does not mean taking um, pain medication or ibuprofen when you're having cramping or birth control um, if indicated, 
what I really am talking about is when we just ignore the body signaling to us by masking it with um, medications. We can certainly use those as support, but it's not a treatment for. So another thing, really ACOG, and um, we have, which is the American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology, have really identified the menstrual cycle as, as a fifth vital sign. So when we think of vital signs, we think of blood pressure, heart rate, oxygenation, height, weight, these are all important vital signs that we look at. And so they're really talking about the, the menstrual cycle and menstrual health is, is really vital to a woman's health assessment. So it's something we should be looking at and understanding. So this is, a, I'm going to take some time to revisit talking about the menstrual cycle because I don't know about you, but I did not learn really about the menstrual cycle. Um, when I was growing up, really not until getting into functional medicine um, and learning more about hormones, hormone replacement, did I really understand what was going on in my physiology every month. And I know this is women that I talk to on the daily, we do not truly understand the cyclical nature of what's going on in our body. So I want to take some time to talk about that. First, I just want to kind of go through a little quiz. Um, again, I'm not sure I can see the chat. Um, oops. Just some kind of myths, kind of some questions I want to ask and see if you guys think about your answers and then we'll talk about them on the next page. But um, these are some kind of questions that we oftentimes may or may not get correct. So every woman's cycle has is 28 days. A woman can get pregnant any day of the month. The pill regulates a woman's period. And progesterone is low in the second half of a woman's cycle. So to answer these questions, so really a woman's menstrual cycle normally, a normal menstrual cycle can vary quite greatly from woman to woman. So anywhere from 25 to 35 days um, is considered a normal menstrual cycle, averaging usually around 26 to 32 days. We really look for menstrual cycles to being regular from month to month. So if you consistently have a 35 day cycle and that's consistent for you from month to month, then that is that is considered within a normal variant, right? A normal variation. Or if you have a shorter cycle, what we're, what we're looking for as more of a concern is when we're having like a 25 day, a 35 day, you know, we're really jumping from different links between cycles. And so that's really where we kind of have to think, hmm, I wonder, you know, what what could be causing that? So a big myth, and I think birth control has kind of, um, you know, been a proponent of this in a sense, is that women do not realize that we can only get pregnant five to six days out of the month, not every time you have intercourse. And so this is an education piece that I have with a lot of women. So during ovulation, which we'll talk a little bit more about the cycle in the next slide, but ovulation happens usually around day 12 to 14 of your menstrual cycle, day one being the first day that you bleed. And so an egg, once it's released, is really only viable um, for 24 hours. However, sperm can you know, live in the uterus for up to six days. So we look at the sort of fertile window as being sort of the buffer leading up to ovulation and then 24 hours after ovulation as far as the days that women can be pregnant. There's a lot of um, really period tracker apps that can help with that. There's also testing your basal temperature that can let us know um, when that fertile window is. But really, you cannot get pregnant every day of the month, only five to six days. Otherwise, you are not considered fertile and you can have unprotected intercourse if you're not trying to get pregnant. Um, the birth control pill does not regulate your cycles in the way we think. What it does is it stops kind of the communication between the brain and the ovaries. So we have hormones that are driven by the hypothalamus or an and anterior pituitary in our brain that helps to tell our ovaries to prepare a new follicle or egg to be released. And these hormones with birth control are basically reduced. So when we're not having that signaling from the brain to the ovaries, you will not ovulate. So on birth control pills, you are not ovulating. You are not releasing an egg 
bag. It also impacts the cervical, oh, sorry, I missed, that's a typo. Cervical mucus actually becomes thicker, more inhospitable for um, the sperm, as well as men, women might also notice just like vaginal discharge changes. They can become drier um, vaginally with birth control. And also the, the progestin in the birth control pills actually inhibits the lining of our uterus to grow. So women often do have a withdrawal bleed on birth control, but it tends to be a lot lighter because we're not having that typical um, uterine lining growth that we have that second half of our cycle. And progesterone is actually lowest in the first half of our cycle and highest in the second half. So all of those were false. So to go a little bit over hormone levels, again, when we look at, we'll talk more about sort of the cyclical nature, but if we can kind of separate our menstrual cycle into four phases, the menstruation phase, the proliferative phase, ovulation, and then sort of the final secretory or luteal phase. When we look at the first half of the cycle, which is from our period until we release an egg at ovulation, that's considered, that is where estrogen predominates. So when we see this curve here, our body has a, a bleed, all hormone levels are low, right? And then as we get preparing for ovulation, estrogen peaks. With estrogens peaking, it triggers the brain luteinizing hormone, which is produced by, released by the pituitary to surge. When this surges, that causes the egg to be released. And once that is, once ovulation happens, we sort of enter into kind of a more luteal phase, which is where progesterone or progestation, it really thrives. And so follicular phase is estrogen dominates, luteal phase, progesterone dominates. Let's talk about those hormones a little bit more. So estrogen is produced by the ovaries and it is dominant that first half of the cycle. I like to think of estrogen as a very proliferative, a very energizing, it's some people call it kind of the va va voom um, hormone. It really, it helps to um, keep you, your energy levels high. You tend to want to um, be more active, be more social. Um, really, it's sort of very activating. It's a very activating hormone. Progesterone is released actually by that follicle or the corpus luteum in the ovary, right? And that is really released only two weeks out of the month. So it's from ovulation on. Progesterone is kind of the yin to the yang of estrogen. Progesterone is sort of the chill pill, right? It is very calming. It helps to relax smooth muscles. It helps with anxiety and sleep, all of which when estrogen is, is surging, it, those, those symptoms can be heightened. Um, and really it is mostly the most important job of progesterone is to help with implantation of a fertilized embryo, if that were to happen. FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, those are both produced by the pituitary. FSH stimulates the mature, maturation of that developing follicle and luteinizing hormone triggers the release. Testosterone, interestingly, really tends to peak around day nine or 10 of our cycle. So if you ever notice, many of my women struggle with libido, okay, or sex drive. What, we, what they do notice, though, is if they have any inkling of a sex drive, it tends to be around mid-cycle. And if you think about that um, physiologically, you know, it's important for women to have the desire to have sex around the release of an egg. So we tend to see testosterone surging, you know, before ovulation. So usually around day nine and ending around day 12 to 14. So another thing I, I really like to stress in women, because this can be this can be really, there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of um, women being, especially when it comes to emotional PMS, you know, really all over the place throughout the month or 
you know, why can't I just be consistent with that plan? Like what's wrong with me? And in reality, the more we accept and, and really uh, utilize our cyclical nature, right? Every month we are cycling, we are cycling hormones, we are releasing an egg, we are menstruating. And this is a lot to do in a 28 day cycle. You are not supposed to feel the same throughout the entire cycle. You will have periods of time where you'll feel more introverted, more reflective. You'll have times where you'll feel more energized, more wanting to go out and be social. Um, you'll find times where your energy level is peaking, where you can do all the things, make all the plans. And then other times where you're going to want to just retreat, look inward and reflect. And those are all normal parts of being a woman and, and being cyclical in nature. So really, when we talk about different phases, like I said before, um, the menstrual phase is the first phase, and that's really up to three to seven days, and that's your period. All hormone levels are low. We talk about the follicular phase, which is getting ready for ovulation, and that's where estrogen is, is starting to surge and dominate. When we have ovulation, that's, again, where estrogen and luteinizing hormone, FSH, all of these are in an elevated area. And ovulation is sort of the peak. It's kind of where we shine. We oftentimes feel our best. Um, and that is when we're about to um, release an egg. And then the luteal phase is leading up to menstruation. And that is where we tend to just want to put our head down and work to execute and tie up loose ends that we've sort of started at the beginning of the cycle. So if we think about just these hormone fluctuations throughout the month in a cyclical nature. It's really about, we start out by having a purpose, having a plan, having a goal. And that would be in that follicular phase, as well as when we are about to ovulate, that's when we're really in this full outward expression of being more social, wanting to connect, wanting to have those tough conversations. And as we, you know, our energy level will slowly lower as we get closer to our period, but that's really a time to kind of contain, contemplate, complete those tasks, and then to reflect and restore on how all of that went, that cycle. And then you can start anew every cycle. So I just really like to talk to women about this because again, if we if we really tap into our natural flow and our natural cyclical nature, we really can open ourselves up and expand ourselves to some really great possibilities in our life and as well as just giving ourselves more grace on our natural um, cyclical nature. So that's the menstrual cycle. Now we're gonna kind of go back toward, toward sort of PMS and hormone imbalance. So if we think about, you know, the estrogen dominating in the first half, progesterone dominating the second half, it's all a delicate balance. We have multiple hormones, not just the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, FSH, LH. We have other hormones as well. There are, our body wants to be in balance. And so when when things in, start to get out of balance, that's really when, when we're no, going to notice symptoms. And that's really where things go wrong. So when it comes to PMS symptoms, it's it's all about balance. And so when we have too much too much estrogen and too little progesterone, that tends to be when we're going to notice these symptoms and they're going to be heightened. So just to kind of give you a, a list of common symptoms that are associated with estrogen dominance and low progesterone, these are overlapping oftentimes, as well as they're, they're, the causes of these are similar. So when we look at estrogen dominance, we're going to think about breast tenderness, heavy periods, acne, re retaining fluid, um, sugar cravings, insomnia, bloating, headaches, estrogen um stimulates fat cells and it stimulates the fat cells to store fat, which also leads to a decreased amount of available thyroid hormone. So if you think about estrogen dominance alone, it's going to impact fat deposition. And it's typically in that midsection area, right? The hips, the butt, the thigh area. 
Um, and we're also going to, it can also impair our thyroid function. So many women, as we get older, we're going to note it, we're going to see changes in our thyroid. And many of that, much of that can be driven by hormone imbalance, specifically estrogen dominance. So I really like to make that point to women, we need to be monitoring thyroid and estrogen, um, elevated estrogen levels is, is going to affect other hormonal symptoms, hormonal systems. We're also going to see mood swings, irritability, anxiety, and depression. Um, estrogen dominance can be influencing with heavy, uh, really heavy periods and is often seen in PCOS, endometriosis, um, and some of these other more, more severe diagnoses. When we look at low progesterone, this is very common in women um, starting kind of mid thirties on. I, I do see it in, in younger women as well. And really when we think about low progesterone, what is progesterone? Progesterone is kind of our, I call our chill pill. It's, it helps us relax. And so when we have low progesterone, we're going to have more um, predispositions to anxiety insomnia, not having progesterone around, that is going to Im Im affect our fertility. So a lot of women struggling with infertility, we really want to look at that progesterone level the second half of the cycle and su support progester progesterone production so that we can um, have that implantation of the egg and in, in a, a successful pregnancy. Low progesterone is often associated with PMS and PMDD. So PMDD is a much more severe form of PMS. Um, it's PM premenstrual dysphoric disorders. So there's a lot more um, psychosis and sort of mental health, um, worsening mental health symptoms, as well as physical symptoms with that. So causes of low progesterone, because low progesterone is in that second half of the cycle, it's very susceptible to um, estrogen balance, right? As well as blood sugar, high cortisol levels. When we talk about both estrogen dominance and low progesterone, hormone disrupting chemicals, um, our environment and toxins are very detrimental to our hormonal health. It is extremely important to reduce exposures as well as support our natural detoxification um, processes in our bodies. Um, things like fasting, over-exercising, under-eating, lack of sleep, um, adrenal um, function is so important for progesterone. If we are stressed out, not eating enough, our body is not at a state to um, really, if you think about it inherently, when we don't, when we're under a chronic stress, that is not a time to have a baby, if you think about it. And so progesterone is going to be lowered. Progesterone is going to be used to produce more cortisol. Progesterone it can be converted to cortisol. So a lot of women who have struggle with stress um, and chemical exposure, toxins, their, their progesterone is going to be impacted significantly. So I just want to talk a little bit about kind of what's what's sort of a normal variant. I hate the word to say the word normal because it is all varying. Um, but there's really times where these are somewhat normal presentation. And then I really want to make sure women know things, symptoms that are really require a further evaluation and more comprehensive testing. Um, and support. And so normal variations would really just be mild symptoms. So the breast tenderness, bloating, fatigue, mood changes, those are not uncommon. Typically, they're only going to happen a few days before our cycle, and they're not really going to impair, you know, impair our life, right? Our, our cycles will maintain regular, so that 25 to 35 days and be consistent from cycle to cycle for the most part. We're going to see about four to six days of bleeding, typically about 30 to 60 mils of blood. And so if we think about it, a tampon holds about, a regular tampon holds about five mils, a super plus holds about 10 mils and a pad is kind of 10 to 15. So if you think about that over a four to six day period, that's going to be about, you know, we don't want to see saturation of a tampon in an hour um, consistently. That would be a sign of really heavy menstrual bleeding. It's also not uncommon to have a lot of digestive symptoms around our period. As we get close to shedding that lining, our body releases prostaglandins, which cause that kind of cramping and that helping of the shedding of the lining. And for many women, that's going to cause diarrhea, looser stools, um, and some cramping, kind of feeling not so good digestively. And that's not uncommon. Again, we're going we're gonna to look at that in sort of a milder form, right? 
what really needs to be evaluated further are, are really moderate to severe um, hormonal symptoms of PMS, right? The breast tenderness, bloating, fatigue. And this is going to be not only severe, but often lo longer in duration. These really need to be looked at. Um, irregular cycles, like I said, if you're having different cycle links from month to month, nothing's really consistent. That's absolutely something that needs to be evaluated a little bit more further. If you're having really short cycles and um, are you're bleeding between periods, this is this is not sort of a this is something where looking at um, getting a further evaluation would be helpful. Bleeding any longer than eight days is definitely something that you would want to seek um, care for. Severe pain, diarrhea, fevers around periods. It's not uncommon. Sometimes women will have fevers. This is something we want to evaluate and just look at some testing to see if there's something we can do to support that. And then certainly heavier flow. And that would be soaking a plus tampon in less than two hours, passing blood, passing clots um, that are really larger than a quarter size. And so it, it, all of these would definitely warrant um, seeking care. And so now that we've talked about um, you know, PMS, symptoms to know, to be concerned with. Um, and really, there's so many tools that you can do on your own to really help optimize hormones. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. There's, again, there's a lot we can spend on each one of these, but I just want to put them out there as these are the things that I focus on with every patient that I see. Um, we prioritize based on what's going on. Um, if, for, for instance, blood sugar regulation needs a lot of attention, our nutrition, environmental toxins, but I'm going to over, I'm going to assess all of these with all of my patients. Um, these are critical to hormonal health. Really, by the time we have hormone symptoms, we're going to have seen um, dysfunction in the gut. Typically, um, we're going to see adrenal concerns, thyroid concerns, and then you know, oftentimes the hormone imbalance symptoms are, are often the last to present themselves. So nutrition is huge. Blood sugar regulation is just so big. And this is something I stress and talk about from day one, because it's honestly one of the things that you can do right now to see the biggest impact in so many different areas of your health. So really important, if you're struggling with PMS or hormone imbalance symptoms, you need to be eating well-balanced meals every three to four hours throughout a throughout your sort of 12 hour week eating window. No skipping meals. We need to prioritize organic, highly qual high quality whole foods and fiber. Fiber to help support detoxification, to help support elimination through the bowels. We want to avoid intermittent fasting. I am not against fasting in women by any means. There are certain times in our cycle where fasting is much less impacting. But overall, if I am seeing a woman that's struggling with PMS and hormone imbalance, I'm going to take fasting out of the equation. Typically, women were underfed, um, were undernourished, were depleted within our nutrients. So eating high quality food throughout the day um, in regular intervals is so important to support that stress response and to, to help let our body know that it can go out of a fight or chronic fight or flight state and get into sort of a he more healing state. That's also where caffeine, I'm not opposed to coffee or caffeine. I just don't want it to be done, to be drunk first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. So I really um, encourage my women, if they are going to drink coffee, to drink it after breakfast or at least finish breakfast before they finish their coffee and to avoid any caffeine after um, lunchtime. Hydration with proper minerals is, is absolutely if, essential as well. And so I tend to have patients drink half your body weight in ounces of filtered water daily. So what are some specific ways to improve estrogen progesterone balance? Working on the gut is, is so huge for so many reasons, but specifically if you're constipated, um, there's a really, there's a good chance that you aren't clearing out estrogen. So we know we release these hormones in a cyclical pattern. We have to not, when we release hormones, we have to recycle them and we have to eliminate them. And so estrogen, we have um, different estrogen metabolism pathways. And a big one is by eliminating through the stool. And so if we are constipated, the those estrogens that our body is trying to clear, clear out are just going to be recirculated back into our system. So um, having regular bowel movements, if you are struggling with that, 
adding in supplementation, changing diet. Um, those are all things that we'll want to start right away to ensure that you're having one to two bowel movements every single day. We want to support the liver. Again, we're trying to clear out hormones, specifically estrogen, estrogens. And so liver support is huge. That's done through elimination, through nutrition. Um, there's also high quality supplementation that we can do. Infrared saunas are something I recommend regularly. Um, B complexes help to methylate and support estrogen clearance, as well as castor oil packs. I love castor oil packs for um, helping support detox to help support um, hormonal symptoms. So if you've got bloating, cramping, premenstrually, um, these are castor oil packs are great to use, um, to utilize regularly, daily even. Stress is so important. And so again, we live in a, there's so many different stressors that we're exposed to. It's not about living in a bubble. What I really stress with my women is to really connect with their body. So that mind body connection. When we don't feel well or we're so busy, we tend to kind of leave our body behind. It's like we just become a doer, right? And we're not being, right? We are a human being, not a human doing, okay? So that's where we have to build in practices of connecting with our body. And so early on, it can be something like a symptom journal, right? So I'm feeling this is where I'm in my cycle. And these are kind of the symptoms that are going on. Um, and then as you, you know, become more, it becomes more of a habitual practice of checking in with your body, you're, you're better able to know the information that your body is giving you. And then also, understand what you can do to support that or what that might be a sign of. And so in if until we actually stop and try to connect with our body, we're not going to get any of we're not going to get any of the information that it's trying to send to us. So it's there's multiple different practices. I spend a lot of time most of my, you know, everyone, especially someone like myself who's been completely burnt out and like I said, disconnected from my body. Um, there are many practices and it's a big, big area that I stress because in general, as a society, we are very disconnected from our body, our natural rhythm and in nature. Sleeping huge. If you want to do one thing for your body to help support weight, support blood sugar, support adrenals, support hormonal health, it's just getting to sleep. Um, bedtime by 10 PM is ideal. I have three young kiddos. I get it when they go to bed. It's like our time to get stuff done. But in reality, what you should really be prioritizing is winding yourself down so that you can get some high quality sleep. Estrogen supporting supplements, progesterone, these are all very helpful for improving estrogen progesterone balance if, if these lifestyle um, changes aren't helping. Supplements, there's a ton of supplementation, nutraceuticals, bioidentical hormones that I do use with patients. Um, so these are just across the board, very common recommendations and dosings that I um, that I give women. So for estrogen dominance specifically, we're really looking on helping to support our body's clearance of estrogens. So detoxification, gut health, um, and also just calming the nervous system related to the, the high estrogen levels. So DIM, methane, and indole 3 carbonyl, what they do is they help to support estrogen clearance through the liver as well as calcium d -glucurate. So typically with women, I'll start with 100 to 200, 100 to 300 milligrams a day. There's some supplements. Um, Seeking Health has one that's like DIM with indole 3 carbonyl, and that's a great supplement that I like. There's a lot of different brands. I'm happy to recommend specific ones if you have questions, um, but these are just in general, the dosing that I recommend. Probiotics specifically, if we're having um, digestive discomfort, constipation issues, um, we'll oftentimes recommend a probiotic. Um, you know, having enough of the good, the right types of bacteria in our gut is super important for hormonal health, inflammation reduction and healing leaky gut. Um, so these are, that's oftentimes something I'll recommend. Magnesium glycinate or citrate. Citrate, I tend to recommend more if we're more constipated. Glycinate is wonderful for so many reasons. We Most of us are all magnesium deficient. Um, glycinate, I find, really helps with anxiety. It helps with sleep. It helps with kind of muscle cramping. So that's typically a form that I'll recommend um, women take at night. And it just kind of varies depending on... Um, depending on bowels really. So if you're more constipated, we'll, we'll, 
will have you have a higher dose of magnesium. Um, really, I kind of tell women, play around with it to what we call bowel tolerance. So if you take too much and you have diarrhea, then back off the next night. Things to support, specific supplements to support progesterone are, are many. Really supporting the adrenals. There's a lot of the lifestyle factors that I talked about. Managing stress, sleep, um, not fasting, you know, giving your body consistent nu nutrition and nourishing um, throughout the month. But B6 and vitamin B, uh, like a B complex is very helpful for low progesterone. Vitex, our trace tree that actually helps to support production, your own natural project, progesterone production. So it's a very common one that I'll recommend alone or in a combination supplement. Maca is a wonderful adaptogen that helps support um, progesterone, testosterone, and adrenal function. So I really love maca root. It can be very helpful with for energy levels. It can help libido. Um, so it's a common one that I'll recommend um, alone or again in sort of a combination supplement. And then I am not shy to use compounded progesterone. There's also over-the-counter forms of progesterone creams. Um, typically, they're lower um, concentration. So the max dose that I think you can get over the counter is 25 milligrams. Um, and that would be a topical cream. And so I'll recommend progesterone. Um, a lot of times we'll cycle it. So we'll really have women on progesterone really day 14 to 28 of the cycle. So that two weeks before your period where um, progesterone may be lower and you may be having those symptoms of low progesterone. Um, and so orally, uh, progesterone is wonderful. It, it has a lot more kind of sedating, calming properties, which is oftentimes really been really beneficial for those women struggling with low progesterone symptoms. Um, and in general for PMS overall, when we look at supporting fluid retention, dandelion leaf, um, there's teas, there's tinctures, that is wonderful to help support lymphatic flow and help kind of help with that sort of puffiness fluid, fluid retention. L-theanine um, is another wonderful supplement that helps support GABA, which helps to support that sense of calm. So I'll use it a lot with for my patients that are struggling kind of with that anxiety, panic type feeling that can happen throughout the month. And, and you can take 200 to 400 milligrams three times a day, um, really. So you can utilize that throughout the day. Different adrenal supports based on what's going on, whether you're more tired or more anxious, there's different blends that work really well. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, those are super, super helpful for inflammation, um, again, for supporting any nutrient depletion that could be going on. And then for, act for actual cramps, Cramp Bark is um, wonderful. There's multiple different companies that make it. Wise Woman Herbs is one, Wish Garden is another, um, but that can be really helpful for just when you're having menstrual cramps, if they're severe. I also love castor oil packs for that reason as well. So consistently using castor oil packs, um, specifically focusing the pack kind of in the pelvic lower lower abdomen region um, daily is leading up to your period and on your period can be really helpful to support, to minimize some of those more physical symptoms related to um, your period. So if we're, you know, we talked a lot about the lifestyle and now really I, as a clinician, I like to do testing because I find that in, we don't really know what's going on in your body until we test it. There's a lot we can gain through symptoms and really understanding your story and understanding your menstrual cycle and how you feel throughout the month, but nothing um, compares to getting your own personalized testing. So we really need full thyroid testing, which is very rarely done in kind of a traditional medical setting. So that's going to look at all your thyroid hormones, thyroid antibodies. This is very helpful information to look to support. And really oftentimes when we do address an optimized thyroid, we get a, a big improvement in hormone um, symptoms. Vitamin D, B12, um, homocysteine, which is more of an inflammation marker. It lets me kind of know how well your body is methylating or utilizing B vitamins. So it's a very, very helpful marker that I like to, to check in all of my female patients, making sure iron status is appropriate. So again, um, if you are low in iron, that's going to impact your um, PMS symptoms for sure, your energy level. And it's going to definitely, if you're anemic, it's going to definitely heighten around the time of your period because you're 
you know, you already are low on iron levels and then you're bleeding again. So it just tends to deplete you even more. Looking at blood sugar regulation, insulin levels um, is so important. And then when I look at hormone testing, I really like to, to capture hormone levels sort of at that second half of the cycle, about one week before your period. That, that is oftentimes when we see that hormone imbalance play out the most. And so we'll see that estrogen progesterone balance and make sure that that is in a, a good balanced range. I also do a lot of advanced, additional advanced testing. I love um, Dutch, which is a urine hormone adrenal test. There's a Dutch plus, which has not only urine hormone, it also looks at saliva, saliva adrenal hormones, and that's throughout the day. So we're kind of looking at that flux, natural fluctuation of adrenal hormones throughout the day. Stool testing is very helpful. You know, I oftentimes will, for more severe symptoms or concern, we do do the pelvic ultrasounds. And then we'll look at some more advanced testing like prolactin, pregnenolone, um, and then some more advanced cardiometabolic testing. So I also really want to help women start gathering information about their cycle. And so I definitely always recommend all cycling women should be tracking their cycle. Ideally on an app, it's a lot easier to manage than sort of on your calendar, but whatever you're doing, be consistent because this is great information for you, um, especially when things start getting a little bit um, atypical. If you're a normal 28 day and then all of a sudden something changes, it gives you a, more information if you can are consistently tracking. I also, again, am a big proponent of meditation, mindfulness practices, connecting with your body. I personally use the Calm app. They have morning to kind of ground you and, and get you started for your day. I also am a proponent of the Aura Ring. I use have utilized that for years, and that's very helpful for tracking sleep, heart rate variability, and and now what's really great is the newest version. Um, the newest version actually connects with natural cycles, which is a natural, it's actually FDA approved natural fertility method. So it looks at birth, it can either help you with getting pregnant or it can help with um, birth control. And then an EWG, Environmental Work Group, if you have not heard of it, it is a major, amazing resource for all things environmental toxins and products that are clean. And so um, ewg.org, they have an app as well. And so that can really give you resources on how to avoid um, toxins in your environment and what products are safe to you. I really, I hope to continue to do more of these webinars to just kind of educate women and really just un un better understand what's going on in your body. So thank you all very much and have a good, good rest.